<laughs> okay, we'll try this again. Okay. Uh, all right, this is the first module. As I said, this first lecture that we're going to do is going to be kind of like a, a fun lecture where we get to uh, see the impact of electromagnetics in various areas of engineering and science and so forth. Um, this is not something that you're going to be tested heavily on. It's really more for your um, enjoyment or interest uh, so that you can see um, that electromagnetics really plays a, a very big role in pretty much all areas of electrical engineering and other fields as well. So um, we're gonna, uh, we've are gonna. we already touched on the course details in the syllabus last time. We've covered some introductions. As, and um, so today we're getting to this last part about uh, uh, motivation for studying uh, electromagnetics. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over the first few slides for now since we started a little bit late. We covered a lot of this stuff last time in class. I'm going to go right to the material and then we'll come back to some of these slides at the end of the lecture, um, you know, when we have time. So I want to jump right into it. Uh, this, uh, this slide gives uh, in, an overview of some of the applications of electromagnetics um, in our modern world. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of aspects of this picture, um, but you can see here uh, some of the major areas of electromagnetics is um, in, uh, one is electromagnetic waves and fields. Uh, this is widely used in as astronomy and things like wireless communication. Uh, electromagnetics is used uh, for motors, and this is becoming even more important nowadays with the advent of uh, electric vehicles. Um, it's used in various types of display technologies. As you know, light is a type of electromagnetic wave. Uh, there are some new applications of electromagnetics in terms of uh, ways to do propulsion. It's used in research in high energy physics and so on. Uh, it's used for uh, telecommunication, as many of you know. Uh, everyone has a cell phone in your pocket that has several important electromagnetics components. Uh, and most of you may know this, but some of you may not, is that it's, uh, it's formed some basis for, of um, uh, high-speed data communications, not just wireless, but through optical fibers as well. How many of you are familiar with uh, fiber-based optical communications? Okay, um, have you heard of rocket fiber? Has anyone heard of rocket fiber in Detroit? Okay. Well, you know, there's two ways that you can transmit, uh, um, you know, tra transmit data. At least in the U.S., the two most popular ways are um, through the coaxial cable line, so Comcast, and then the other way is through um, optical fibers. Optical fibers can transmit data at, at much, much higher data rates. And um, they're based on optical fibers. You propagate light through fibers. So you have basically like an equivalent of a flashlight. You have an LED on one end of the uh, optical fiber. And that LED is blinking on and off at really, really high data rates, like gigabits per second. And on the other end of the fiber, there's a receiver that picks that converts the light that's being transmitted through the fiber, and it converts it into an electrical signal. So you have a way of, of communicating between one end of the fiber and the other. And um, really, the optical fibers are the backbone of our global internet communications. Many of you hear about satellites being the backbone of global internet communications, which is true. Satellites have the advantage that they're wireless, and you could propagate a signal into space and then back down. Some of you may have heard, like, you know, Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, recently launched another 60 satellites, making them the largest global satellite company in the world. Uh, they have the vehicles to launch 60 satellites at a time. It's pretty crazy. But um, optical fibers are still faster. So one of the main modes of communication that we have between the U.S. and Europe, for example, is a large undersea cable that, that goes in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, you can imagine what that might do to our entire communications infrastructure if something were to happen to that cable. So there were reports, um, I don't know, several months ago about submarines patrolling near, you know, American submarines and then foreign submarines like Russian submarines were patrolling near the undersea cable. So it's, if, if a war were to break out, that would be one of, might be one of the first things to go if someone really wanted to disable uh, global communications. Uh, things like radar, uh, electromagnetic sensors, we're, we're going to talk about some of these things today, cell phones we're going to talk about today, and uh, various types of uh, medical applications of um, electromagnetics. So we're going to uh, just uh, uh, go briefly over um, some of these things in the next, uh, in the next hour or so. 
Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the um, electromagnetic spectrum. So this forms the basis of, of wireless communication. Um, the screen, are you all able to see the screen or maybe would it be helpful if I zoom in a little bit in certain areas? I can, this is helpful, I can zoom in a little bit. All right, so we're going to go over something called Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations describes how electromagnetic waves propagate. Okay, so what is an electromagnetic wave? Does anyone? Anyone? I mean, if you're wrong, if you're, if you're off, it's totally okay. I just want to see where everyone's at. Don't be shy. <laughs> yep. It's a spectrum of light. Okay, that is that is true. Yep. It includes light. It includes visible light. What else does uh, electromagnetic... Uh, waves include? It has different wavelengths. It has different wavelengths. That's right. That's right. Um, an electromagnetic wave, the way it's defined is, um, you know, electromagnetic field that propagates in a certain direction. Okay? And they call them electromagnetic waves because it consists of electrical fields and magnetic fields that are coupled together. And if you look at this, um, this image here, so let's zoom out for a second. So what happens is that there is uh, an electric field that's going in one direction. So if you look at, we're going to look a little bit closely at this image here. The electric fields are going in, in the Z direction. Okay, they're, they're, they're pointed upwards in some cases, and then they're pointed downwards. And you can see that if you just look at the electric field, which is in red, it forms a sinusoid. Okay, so this is a, uh, an electric field forming a sinusoidal wave. So that's the electrical part. The magnetic part is a second sinusoidal wave that's oriented at a 90 degree angle. And it's also sinusoidal. Okay? The interesting thing about electromagnetic waves is that the electrical fields and the magnetic fields travel at an orthogonal direction. They're always 90 degrees apart. And this is described by Maxwell's equations because electric moving electric fields can generate, um, moving charges can generate uh, magnetic fields, and then um, uh, moving magnetic fields can actually initiate uh, voltages as well. So that's why electric fields and magnetic fields, when they are um, uh, when they are in an AC mode as opposed to a DC mode. Remember, in last time in class, I mentioned that if you have a static field, and a static field means that this field is not changing with time. When you have static fields, electrical and magnetic fields are not coupled together. They are completely independent of one another. But when the fields are varying in time, then they become coupled together. And the electric fields and the magnetic fields actually um, uh, kind of play off each other. That's the best way to describe it. So if you can imagine that you have an electric field and a magnetic field that's uh, propagating in a certain direction, that is the basis of uh, electromagnetic waves. Now, electromagnetic waves, um, some of you have mentioned light. Some of you had mentioned um, uh, radio waves, but there's a whole spectrum uh, of different types of electromagnetic waves. And the way they're categorized is based on uh, the wavelength. Okay, uh, Some of you may remember that um, uh, uh, high energy waves have a low wavelength and uh, low energy waves have a high wavelength. Okay, uh, the, 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 uh, the product, let me write this down. Does anyone remember this relationship? C is equal to wavelength times the frequency. So what is C? It's a light constant, right? It's a, C is the speed of light. Speed of light. And that's given in meters per second. This is the wavelength. And this is given in meters. And what's the F? Frequency. What's the uh, what units for frequency? Hertz. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, hertz is equal to one over a second. Yeah. So, what's going to happen um, is that C is a constant. Okay. C is a speed of light. It's it's roughly three times ten to the eighth meters per second. 
And that's the speed at which electromagnetic waves travel in a vacuum, through air, through vacuum, similar. Then there's wavelength, and then there's frequency. Notice that the wavelength and the frequency, the product of the two is equal to C, right? That means that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional to each other. So um, a wave that has a small wavelength will have a high frequency, all right? And it turns out that there's this other relationship too, E equals H F. This is Planck's constant. And then this is the frequency again. And then this is the energy. Okay? So E is equal to H times F. Planck's a, uh, H is a constant, Planck's a constant, and then F is a frequency. So there's two things we can learn from these two equations. The first thing is that electromagnetic waves have uh, a wavelength and frequency that are inversely proportional to each other. So low wavelength will correspond to high frequency, and uh, low frequency will correspond to high wavelength. The second thing is that um, the energy of a wave is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. That means high frequency, high frequency, low wavelength waves have the highest amount of energy. High energy, let me say that again. High frequency waves have high amounts of energy. Okay. High frequency, low wavelength waves have a lot of energy. So that's where this electromagnetic spectrum is coming from. All right, so let's take a look at uh, you know, what, what the size scales that we're talking about are. So if we go all the way on the right, on the, starting on the left side of the spectrum, very, very, very large. Okay, Does this have higher or low energy, the ones on the left? Low, low energy. Right? Large wavelength corresponds to low energy. Um, what are low energy waves good for? Well, they're good for communications. Okay, AM radio. Uh, AM radio happens at a frequency of about 600 kilohertz to 1.6 megahertz. You know, when you tune your radio, that, that's the frequency that you're tuning to. FM radio is 80, 88 to 108 megahertz. Um, so these have the, the smallest frequencies and the largest wavelengths. The wavelengths of these types of waves are on the order of a football field. If you actually calculate it, if uc equals lambda times f, you figure out what the wavelength is. One wavelength, so one period of the sinusoid for an AM radio wave is an entire football field. So it's pretty huge. All right. So, um, but it turns out that these types of low energy waves are good. At, they're good at penetrating walls and things like that. Okay. So that's why AM radio and FM radio are used for radio, uh, have been used for decades for uh, radio broadcasting. We go slightly up in, in, the, um, uh, um, in the energy, meaning we, we're increasing the frequency. As we go from left to right, we're increasing the frequency and we're decreasing the wavelength. So your mobile phones, uh, your mobile phones operate at um, anywhere between 900 megahertz to 2.4 megahertz for the GSM bands and some of the CDMA bands that are used for US wireless communications like Sprint, Verizon, and so forth. So um, in this range, this is called the microwave portion of the radio, um, of, the ra of, of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these typically have uh, wavelengths on the order of a few feet to centimeters. Okay, so se um, most of the 2.4 gigahertz stuff work, at, work in the centimeter uh, regime. So, you know, it's the size of a baseball or so. These types of waves are also helpful. I mean, they're also good in the sense that they can penetrate through walls and stuff. You know, you, your cell phones can work on one side of the wall versus the other. Um, but, can I, but there's an advantage of these types of waves versus the, um, versus the longer wavelength ones. Can anyone tell me what that is? Yes, exactly. Higher frequency means higher data rates. Okay, if you're trying to put, you know, we try to send information through these electromagnetic signals. And the way that we do that is that we modulate the electromagnetic signal. We modulate either the frequency of the electromagnetic signal, the amplitude of the um, electromagnetic signal, or we even pulse the electromagnetic signal in some ways. There's a variety of different coding, to, coding methods and signal uh, communication methods that are way beyond the scope of this class. But um, the point is we use electromagnetic waves to transmit information. And when the, it turns out that the electromagnetic waves that are at a higher frequency can transmit information at a faster data rate. Okay, so when 
uh, you know, we have this electromagnetic spectrum that, that the government actually auctions off to private companies. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But, um, you know, with Sprint, Verizon, these, uh, uh, these companies will actually buy portions of the spectrum from the government and uh, the government allows them to operate at these, at these frequencies. You, you can't have um, tons of companies operating at the exact same frequency. You'd have interference, right? So each company is allotted a certain portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that they are allowed to operate in. And typically these bands I mentioned, three, th 900 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz. So the higher frequency bands are actually more valuable and companies will pay more money for it because they can uh, transmit data at a faster rate. All right, so that's uh, that's the microwave portion of the spectrum. You know, also operating at 2.4 gigahertz or microwave ovens, um, they're not transmitting information. They're just transmitting very high energy uh, waves to because it turns out that water um, water actually tends to heat up when you when you blast it with electromagnetic radiation in the two gigahertz range. So that's what causes your food to uh, heat up quite rapidly. Um, your Wi-Fi, your home Wi-Fi routers, they operate at 2.4 gigahertz. Some of them operate at 5 gigahertz nowadays. What's that? Dual band routers. The dual band ones operate at 5 gigahertz. That's right. And uh, 5 gigahertz, you know, you, you, you know now that like 5 gigahertz uh, uh, supports faster data rates. That's one of the reasons why. They also have less interference because if 80% of the routers are operating at 2.4 gigahertz and you're operating at 5, there's less interference happening. Um, Moving on, um, so radar works at even um, uh, uh, s higher energies, higher frequencies, smaller wavelengths. Uh, they work at 1 to 100 gigahertz. Okay, so obviously with radar, you can transmit data faster. One of the disadvantages, though, is that as you go to higher and higher energies, it doesn't penetrate things as well. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why certain types of radar have a hard time penetrating through walls, um, but uh, a low frequency radio signal can penetrate through walls. Yeah, question. Why is that? Why is that? That's a, that's a really good question. So it turns out that this has to do with how <coughs> materials absorb electromagnetic energy. All right, and I'm gonna give you a very hand wavy argument, but I think, I think it'll kind of make sense to you. Um, if you imagine an, an atom, okay? Imagine an atom as a dipole. Meaning like um, an atom has uh, certain parts of it that are positively charged, certain parts of it that are negatively charged, right? Um, and when you put an atom in an electric field, the atom can polarize. And polarize is just a fancy way of saying that the electric charges go pull in one direction versus the other. So I'll um, put this up here. Um, so let's say this is an atom. And you put this, um, you put this atom in. Let's say you were to take a voltage source, and um, you put a positive voltage here, a negative here, a positive build up here, a negative build up here, and you create an electric field that's pointed downwards like this. Okay. In the presence of an electric field, the atom is going to polarize, meaning like. The, the negative charges are going to pull over to one side and the positive charges are going to pull over to the other side. And um, when you take away the electric field, that polarization disappears. Now, um, atoms have certain resonant frequencies. Meaning like, you know, like if you take, um, if you take a tuning fork, you know, you hit the tuning fork and it, and it vibrates at a very specific frequency. You, you take a, a cello, who, who's a cello player in the class? <laughs> yeah. You take a cello, you know, you put, you pull, uh, you pull the string uh, with your bow, and it resonates at a specific frequency, right? Similarly, atoms also have these resonant frequencies. If you if you stimulate it with an electric field at a particular frequency, the atom will start to resonate with the electric field, and um, as a result of that, it will actually absorb more energy at certain wavelengths. Okay, so water molecules absorb energy at certain wavelengths, and like it actually absorbs energy at 2.4 gigahertz. That's the reason why. It's difficult to get uh, Bluetooth signals going through uh, water. You know, you, you won't see Bluetooth operating underwater. You'll never see that because Bluetooth is, <coughs> operates at 2.4 gigahertz and um, these signals just don't propagate in water because water molecules absorb that 2.4 gigahertz energy. So, um, you know, that, that's actually a good segue into this next part here. Um, 
we use electromagnetics for doing um, doing various types of imaging, right? Every time you walk through an airport, you guys know this, you have those, um, unless you have TSA, which is great, but TSA PreCheck is great. I, I had that, I got that six months ago. It's so wonderful. Um, but you know, like it, you go through those airport scanners and you have this thing, you have this big wide uh, thing that just sort of rotates around. So what that is, it's actually um, sending sending out electromagnetic radiation and it's going out in these different directions. The reason why it scans around like this is because it's doing this technique called tomography where they're sending out electromagnetic signals from all different angles and it helps them image better. But certain, getting back to the point here is that um, certain frequencies are, your body is transparent at certain frequencies and your body is not transparent at other frequencies. So what they do in screening, they pick this in, in the 0.2 to 4 terahertz area is they pick a frequency where um, you can actually see through parts of your body, okay? And this allows you to see if, you know, if an individual is carrying something inside or, or what have you. Um, it's also used for, um, for medical, you know, for medical imaging as well, for medical purposes, as well as like homeland security type applications. But it's taking advantage of the fact that um, electromagnetic energy is absorbed at certain wavelengths and is transmitted and, and it, it passes right through at other wavelengths. It depends on what the material is. Um, have, has anyone heard of terahertz, um, terahertz communication? The word terahertz. Okay, it's, um, it's an area of active research right now. Um, it involves the area of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is around one terahertz. So it's higher energy than microwaves, it's, uh, but at lower energy than visible light, okay? For, for many decades, we were able to create electronic devices that can create, that can generate and detect electromagnetic radiation in the, um, in the megahertz range. That was many decades ago. Then our electronics got better and we got to work in the gigahertz range and suddenly we had, we had cell phones and Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, now they're trying to push the spectrum into the terahertz range. Terahertz range will give us even more rapid uh, uh, communication abilities. Um, and it, will, it also has certain types of sensing capabilities. So um, some of the research applications of terahertz is for, uh, for screening and, um, and imaging. It's difficult to make electronic devices that operate in the terahertz regime or else this would have been done like many decades ago. So it's, it's an area, excuse me, it's an area of active research uh, right now. Um, once we go past the terahertz, we go into the 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 16th hertz, which corresponds to wavelengths in, um, in the micron to hundreds of nanometer range. Okay, so all we're doing is we're going up in the spectrum, lower wavelengths, higher energy. By the time we get to this area of the spectrum, now we are in um, the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can actually see. We can't see radio waves, we can't see cell phone waves, we can't see radar waves, but we can see electromagnetic radiation between 700 nanometers and 440 nanometers. Okay, our eyeballs have evolved to be able to see the, that part of the spectrum. Um, so. Uh, red, you know, you guys have heard the Roy G. Biv, uh, red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, violet. I get that right? <laughs> All right, that part is the electromagnetic spectrum is one that our eyes can see. Uh, so the typical wavelengths are in the one micron and submicron uh, regime. All right, and uh, visible light is used for whole bunch of different applications. I mentioned the, the optical fiber telecommunications as one thing. Um, obviously, the uh, visible light is used for, you know, being able to see at night. It's used in remote controls. Um, nowadays, uh, it, there are, we're able to access more parts of the spectrum. So uh, we can create devices that, that generate light at uh, ultraviolet uh, levels. So in the 200 to 350 nanometer regime, this is a little bit beyond the um, visible. Actually, let me finish talking about the visible first. Um, visible light used to be pretty much like entirely incandescent bulbs. Now we have uh, LEDs that can, uh, that are much more energy efficient. If we go a little bit out in, in uh, just beyond uh, uh, 700 nanometers, okay, uh, 
and we get into the uh, infrared range. In the infrared range, interestingly, things that emit heat give off infrared radiation. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, one is if you ever you know, go out to a restaurant on a cold day and they have an outdoor seating area, you know how they have like these lamps that, um, that you stand under the lamps and you just feel warm? Yeah. Well, they're giving, off, um, they're giving off infrared light. Remember, infrared light you can't see. You can see some of the light that they're giving off. They're giving some energy off in the visible spectrum, but they're also giving energy off in the infrared spectrum. And the infrared spectrum is things that we, we feel as heat. Okay, um, night vision goggles have the ability to actually see infrared uh, wavelengths and so we can see hot objects. So uh, there are specific types of sensors that are designed to detect infrared radiation, things like uh, infrared bolometers, um, which, which is undergoing a revolution of its own nowadays. Our night, our night vision capabilities, it's, it's become a lot better, higher resolution, and even a lot cheaper. I don't know, you can go to Amazon today and actually buy a thermal imaging camera from for a few, couple hundred bucks that, that snaps into your iPhone. If uh, You know, you can look it up on Amazon if you're interested. Um, all right, so that's the infrared. We covered the, the visible part of the spectrum. Now we go even to higher energy. If you go slightly above the visible part of the spectrum, now you're into the ultraviolet range. All right, ultraviolet, uh, radiation um, probably became famous in the 80s and 90s because we started to realize that too much ultraviolet radiation uh, resulted in skin cancer. Um, and uh, uh, the, the reason why is one of the points I'm going to mention to you is that as we go to higher and higher energies, it becomes more and more dangerous to the human body. The reason why is because uh, uh, what happens at, at uh, higher frequencies? How, what happens to the energy? Greater. The energy is greater. As you go to higher frequencies, the energy is greater. As a result, the molecules in your body, the biomolecules in your body, become more susceptible to damage when you subject it to higher energy radiation. Um, specifically, one of the things that happens is DNA damage. Uh, so uh, um, ultraviolet radiation can cause... Um, nicks and defects in your DNA. DNA is kind of like the blueprint in your body. It's it's a it's a set of molecules that tells your body how to build tissue. When, you know, if you get um, if you're building new skin tissue, you're building new hair tissue, and any type of it's the instructions that your body uses to create those tissues. If the instruction set is messed up, if the blueprint of your house is messed up, then you're going to build wrong parts for your house. And this is how cancer originates. So. That's one of the reasons why um, as we go, you know, to ultraviolet and then x-ray and then gamma ray radiation, these things are not safe for, uh, for humans. Um, our ultraviolet light sources, they used to be like these long, um, these long uh, tubes that are used in tanning beds, you know. Uh, nowadays, you can get ultraviolet radiation, very small form in the form of ultraviolet LEDs. And they're used for uh, curing. They're used... Um, for looking at, there's certain types of inks that only glow in, uh, in ultraviolet. So you've seen some of the black light LEDs. Uh, that's what those are based on. Um, and another big application of, of ultraviolet is in lithography. So Intel and AMD and all these other companies that are making these really, really tiny transistors, they're using ultraviolet lithography and extreme ultraviolet lithography to actually define where those transistors go and define those patterns. It's, um, uh, they spend billions and billions of dollars on EUV equipment in order to do their, um, their next generation microprocessors. Okay, uh, any questions on this stuff so far? All right. Um, all right, so uh, once we get into a, a extreme ultraviolet, we are on the size of uh, 10 to the eighth. We're at about 10 nanometers or so wavelength. Um, once we go beyond that, once we go to one nanometer or sub nanometer, now we are in the X-ray regime. X-ray regime is very high energy electromagnetic radiation. Um, it's used in uh, medical X-rays. It's used in baggage screening and it's used in crystallography. 
So x-rays actually were invented, believe it or not, like in the 1800s. And uh, the energy in x-rays is so high that it just goes right through your body. It goes right through your tissue. Um, but it gets diffracted. It gets diffracted and absorbed to some extent by bone. Okay, so your bones show up well uh, in the x-ray, and that's the reason why it's used. You know, if you break a bone or something, you typically will get um, an x-ray. X-ray technology has come a long ways. Um, uh, there's x-ray tomography nowadays and CT scans where you can generate three-dimensional x-ray images. And um, this stuff is pretty well regulated in the medical industry because you don't want to give a person too much x-ray exposure. You know, people who work in, in radiology in the hospital, they have... They, some of them actually have sensors to make sure that they don't exceed an x-ray dose, um, a certain amount of x-ray dose per year, because that can cause birth defects and other types of things. Um, so yeah, this, has, this type of technology has come a long way. Uh, x-rays are used at the airports to screen your baggages. This is why they have those, um, they have the covering around the machine that does baggage screening, because that type of radiation would be harmful to, um, uh, to humans. But it's very good at seeing through stuff. That's why they use it. Um, what else? Uh, there's some things that, that x-rays doesn't do a good job at seeing through. Like, for example, like, like metals. Uh, x-rays have a hard time going through metals. So uh, I was at an airport once, and um, I was visiting a relative. And my, my mom had given me some sweets to take to that relative. And I happened to wrap it in aluminum foil. Well, she had wrapped it in aluminum foil. And there were probably like three cases of it. <laughs> and I was late for my flight. <laughs> they saw that they made me unwrap every single one <laughs> so that they could rescreen it. And then, uh, then they allowed me to go. I, I barely, barely made my flight. But anyway, uh, so yeah, d avoid uh, aluminum foil if, if, you're, if you're going through TSA. Uh, what else can I mention? Okay, uh, one of the reasons why x-ray is used for uh, <coughs> certain types of imaging, this, this is an application called x-ray crystallography. Um, crystallography is where you're actually looking at the shape of individual atoms by looking at their diffraction patterns. And we're not gonna get into the details of that, but the, the one lesson, the one key point that I wanna make here is that when your wavelengths get smaller, um, there's, uh, uh, you're able to see smaller things, okay? So there's two advantages that we know now. Why do we want to go to higher energy? And we also know of disadvantages of why we want to go to higher energy. So this is another advantage of why we want to go to higher energy is that if we're using that energy for imaging, we can see smaller things. So for example, if we use just a regular microscope, a regular microscope works in visible light, okay, which is uh, 500 to 400 nanometers or so. And it turns out because of a rule by like uh, the Rayleigh scattering law, we a visible light microscope that operates at say 500 nanometers, the smallest object that it can see is, you know, between like half a wavelength and one wavelength. So between 250 and 500 nanometers. If you want to see something smaller than 500 nanometers, then you have to use smaller wavelength light. So uh, um, people who are trying to look into individual atoms have to use electromagnetic imaging that has, uh, that uses light or that uses electromagnetic energy with wavelengths on similar size scales. So an atom has a size scale of typically about one angstrom, which is 10 to the negative 10 meters. And um, so crystallographers will, will use that in, um, uh, in, their, um, in their imaging methods. And then finally, like we get into um, the really high energy uh, radiation. So PET positron emission tomography is a high resolution imaging technique that's used in biomedical imaging. Wayne State actually has a big PET center here. Um, it is difficult to generate high energy waves. So PET, uh, PET imaging is not as, um, it's not as uh, uh, popular as X-ray imaging or MRI imaging, but it's just something to be uh, aware of. And then if you go to even higher energies, so this will be like, um, this will have wavelengths that are subatomic scale and uh, frequencies that are in the, in the 10 to the 21 hertz. So these are gamma rays. Um, there are, you know, astronomical objects that give off gamma uh, radiation. And that's, um, that kind of radiation would definitely be um, harmful to uh, individuals.
All right, so this is you know all parts of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum here. Um, as I mentioned, this portion, the radio spectrum, you know, between uh, um, uh, uh, 10 to the third and 10 to the negative two uh, wavelength is uh, the, w the one that we use for wireless communication. But mainly, like the, the most frequent, common frequencies that are used are in the high megahertz, hundreds of megahertz to uh, two gigahertz um, uh, wave band. And so electromagnetics plays an important role. So engineers, electromagnetics engineers will design the antennas, they'll design the base stations, um, they'll design the, um, the cell phones themselves, and uh, they'll also design um, the distribution of base stations, like how far apart do these radio towers need to be in order to um, uh, ensure that we have a, um, a uniform and good signal coverage. So everybody gets their four or five bars of signal everywhere in the area. So that's all based on uh, electromagnetics. Um, a few years ago, there was a lot of, uh, lot of concern, I think there still is, about the, the level of electromagnetic radiation that, um, that is absorbed by your body. Your cell phone is generating electromagnetic radiation to communicate with the cell tower. The cell tower is, is generating communication, um, generating electromagnetic energy to communicate back. When you have a cell phone like right next to your head, um, the antenna it generally is emitting, it's isotropic. Isotropic means it's giving off energy in all directions. Um, some of that energy is actually going into your head. Uh, there is some concern, um, but not like, as far as I know, not no... Um, uh, no definitive studies that say that this electromagnetic energy is um, causes things like cancer or something like that, but um, but there have been like smaller studies that have been like suggested things like that. So it's been in the news about that. And one of the as some of you have heard about five G technology. Five G technology uses higher power, but it can generate um, but it can transmit higher uh, uh, data rates. One of the concerns with 5G operating at a higher electromagnetic energy is that there's more of this energy that's going into your, um, that's being absorbed by your body at times. So, um, you know, this is one, one thing where um, electromagnetics definitely plays, uh, plays a role. There are a lot of people in electromagnetics who design antennas. And, um, this is something I just added this year because uh, I think it's pretty interesting. Our, our world really relies a lot on wireless communications in order to, you know, where would we be without our, <laughs> without our uh, 4G LTE and being able to stream Netflix wherever we are, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, th this electromagnetics uh, in wireless communications ha has a long history, you know, and a, and a big part of that history is being able to design antennas that can receive and transmit electromagnetic radiation. So what does an antenna do? We, we, I mean, we all know we have Wi-Fi routers in our house, we have cell phones in our pockets. All of these devices have antennas in them, and antennas are basically, at a very simple level, just pieces of metal, you know, strips of metal that have a specific shape, for example, a specific length, a specific geometry, that causes, causes it to absorb electromagnetic energy. Okay, and the way that they're designed is that, for example, a very simple example is if you have an antenna that looks like, you know, look at an antenna like on your Wi-Fi router like this. Okay, the length of that antenna is designed to be a quarter of the wavelength of the radiation that you are trying to detect. A 2.4 gigahertz communication, I don't know if someone can do the math, if I remember right, it's like something around 10 to 20 centimeters would be one wavelength. 2.4 gigahertz, that means the wavelength is around like, you know, 10 or 20 centimeters. I don't remember off the top of my head. So these things are designed to be um, a, a quarter uh, wavelength of that. Six. What's that? 0.6. 0.6? Yeah, that would be a quarter of the 2.4. Oh, no, no, no. Um, the, the, so you start at, the, the way you do it, and we can actually, Maybe someone can do this calculation, or maybe we should, we'll just do it. Okay, if someone at the calculator can help me out here. So, uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second equals uh, 2.4 2.4 times 10 to the 9th. So, can someone solve for the, um, I'm sorry, that's the frequency. Ah. 
Frequency is 2.4 times 10 to the 9th hertz. And um, can someone solve for the wavelength? Let's do it right now. You can see what the wavelength of your Wi Fi routers is. 2.4 times 10 to the 9th? 10 to the 9th. Gigahertz is uh, 10 to the 9th. 0 0.125. 0 0.125. Okay, so wavelength equals 0.125 meters. Okay, so about 12.5 centimeters. That's one wavelength. Okay, so if you want to design a basic type of like like a antenna, you would make it a fraction like a half or quarter quarter of the um, uh, uh, of the wavelength, and that's why these antennas have a certain length. Right. So that's one type of basic antenna, but there's a whole different um, there's a whole slew of different types. For example, here's this is something from ResearchGate that just uh, shows the different uh, various geometries of antennas. There's a simple dipole antenna, um, and there's a, a monopole antenna. A, a dipole antenna has two um, basically electric electric strips, and then these two wires go into the two ends of your amplifier. There's a loop antenna. Um, this is where you have uh, something that goes um, you know that goes in a circle. Uh, there's a monopole type antenna. There's a microstrip patch, there's a slot antenna, uh, parabolic reflector antennas. Th these are the things that are used in satellites, by the way. Corner reflectors, Yagi arrays, and then horn antennas. All of these different types of geometries are designed to take electromagnetic radiation that's propagating through air and get it into that metal, and, you know, get it into that metal line, because that metal line can then uh, um, send it off to an amplifier where you can amplify the signal and you can detect it. All right. So each one of these geometries is designed in a way to maximize the gain of the antenna. The gain of the antenna is, you know, if you put in a certain amount of electrical power, how much power does it emit into the air? That's in the transmission mode. In the receiving mode, how, depending on how much power is coming, how much power is coming into the antenna, and then how much power are you getting out of it? Okay. The ratio of those two is what the gain of the antenna is. And um, engineers spend their entire careers designing high gain antennas for very specific applications. So just to give you an idea of, um, you know, some of the state of the art that was um, many decades ago. All right, wireless communication and antennas have been around for more than a century. Um, they were used in World War I, World War II. Um, uh, there, you know, e even back, you know, back in the 70s, this is showing a picture of the Voyager spacecraft. All right, and some of you may have heard the Voyager spacecraft. It definitely was made. It definitely was uh, launched well before uh, all of you were born. Uh, it was born. It was launched in the 70s, but recently it made history as uh, the first man-made object to get past the edge of our solar system. It's the first object that we've made that's gone outside of our solar system. And um, it recently transmitted some information some information about the elect electromagnetic radiation that's at the at the edge of our solar system that, that was just last year and it's really really fascinating stuff. Um, you think about how uh, an object that far away can still communicate. To this day it's still communicating. It's just remarkable that it's still communicating with satellites on Earth. Um, these types of parabolic antennas have very, very high amounts of gain, and they're able to detect very, very tiny signals. It's just incredible. So they have a dish like this on, on the Voyager spacecraft, and then they have these massive antenna arrays on Earth, multiple arrays of these um, types of antennas that can pick up very, very faint uh, signals uh, coming from the spacecraft. Yeah? How big does the antenna need to be on the satellite? Um, ooh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I don't know what the exact measurements are on the Voyager spacecraft, but um, the larger the dish is, the better gain you're going to get. So they have to do a trade-off, you know, be between how much does it cost to launch this massive thing into space versus how much gain you're going to get. Yeah, but that's a good question. But I, that's why on Earth they just make these massive dishes, you know. Uh, was there another question over here? So you know, and nowadays, you know. Uh, 
uh, it, communication with uh, you know within our solar system is now becoming very commonplace. The Cassini spacecraft, the Mars rover, you know, like it's um, it, it's it's quite uh, you know, we almost take it for granted right now. But it's quite amazing that we can do this. Um, a piece of trivia, I, like I said, today's kind of a fun day, so I, I want you know just like throwing pieces of trivia out at you. Um, does anyone know how long it takes if we were to communicate with Mars? If we had astronauts on Mars living there today, if you were to, um, like, you know, send a text message from Mars back to Earth, how long would it take to get back here? Three years. Yeah, it depends if it's iMessage or Android, of course. So. Yeah. No, no, but just like based on fundamental limits, speed of light. The signal, imagine the signal travels at the speed of light, how long would it take to get back to the Earth? 14 minutes. Uh, how far? Close. 14 minutes, close. 12 minutes. A little bit less than that. 11 minutes. 10. Eight, eight, eight minutes. Oh. Eight minutes. Since uh, a lot of you are Netflix, like to watch Netflix, as I found out, there's a cool show called Mars. There's, there's a series on Netflix called Mars, which is sort of envisioning like what it'll be like for astronauts to live, uh, live on Mars. And one of the things they talk about is the fact that you can't have phone conversations. You know, if, if you said one thing and it took eight minutes to get, get home and then eight minutes to reply again, you wouldn't get a reply for 16 minutes. Right? So it's, um, anyway, it's, it's just some interesting things to uh, think about. The wireless communication, we take it for granted on Earth that we can talk to anyone instantly on Earth. But that's not the case because these electromagnetic waves are traveling at the speed of light. Um, and while the speed of light, you know, everything is instantaneous on Earth, it's, that's not the case throughout the, you know, once we start to go to other planets. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit more about antennas, getting back to um, get off the tangent. So um, as I mentioned, you know, your standard, um, you know, monopole or dipole antenna is just like a fraction of the wavelength. It's quite large, right? Um, so, but there's a lot of interest nowadays in making portable wireless devices, right? We're talking about wearable devices, um, I don't know if I have this on me. Yeah, if any of you would like to see, I'll just, uh, I'm going to pass this around. I need to get it back by the end of the period. Um, it, th this is an example of a wearable device that we made that has, a, that has an antenna built into it. Um, that's the heart rate sensor that I was telling you about that, that our lab's working on. Is it fashionable? It's not fashionable yet. This is just the electronics. <laughs> Um, so there, there's an interest in, you know, we don't want to have these long antennas, right? These big antennas. Uh, we want to make them small, compact, right? So uh, there's been a lot of emphasis, a lot of effort that's been put into making these antennas smaller. One way to do it is by taking the antenna and just making it like winding it around like this, you know, doing it in a meandering pattern. That's one way to do it. So in, in printed circuit boards, uh, electronic circuit boards, you'll often see uh, this type of like a, a long trace like this um, and that serves as the antenna. Okay, so this is typically, I don't know, it could be like um, uh, two or three centimeters wide because your antenna needs to be like something like, you know, uh, two to six centimeters and by folding it like this, they, get, they can put it in a more uh, compact space. By the way, the device that I'm passing around, it actually has the antenna built into uh, the printed circuit board. It's kind of like what you see here. Um, for even for, for some type of devices, even that wasn't good enough. We need the antenna even smaller than that. All right? So then, then people started to go to chip antennas. This is a new technology. Well, not new anymore, um, but it's probably like, you know, 15 years old or so. Uh, this is where you take an antenna and you, um, you make an antenna out of a multi-layer chip capacitor or MLCC. And now you can make your antennas this big, the size of this blue thing here. Amazing. This is why you can have, um, you know, you, you have your mouse dongles and your Bluetooth dongles that are just like, they're literally this big. This is because of chip antenna technology. Um, they've managed to optimize um, a multi-layer metal structure that can uh, receive and transmit uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and they make it super small. This is the size of a quarter here. All right. Um, does anyone know what kind of antenna this is? Does anyone know what this is? It's a car. <laughs> it's a car. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a shark fin, right? But the, yeah, this is a certain type of antenna that uh, 
antenna design that that uh, that's works well for cars. Um, this is another type of antenna, which is just like it's like a, just like a loop of wire, like a, a length of wire. All right. Uh, did anyone hear about? This is a, a good example of why antenna design is important. Does anyone hear about antenna gate on the Apple iPhone four or five? Yeah. When they had uh, antenna issues in the first release. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a big hoopla about it because you know everyone's crazy about Apple phones. Um, well, in cell phones, you know, I mentioned this issue that uh, that the antennas, uh, the larger antennas, t tend to have better efficiency. You know, we're able to make antennas like small in this chip format, but larger antennas typically have better gain, better efficiency. So um, engineers had came up with a very clever way. Apple engineers and other came up with a clever way to say, hey, you know what? We have this big piece of aluminum on the outside of our phones. Um, why don't we just use that as an antenna? Brilliant idea, right? But this is where poor antenna design can get you into trouble. Um, if you look closely here, what they did, um, one of the things that was done here is they had, uh, they created this uh, strip of metal. If we look at some of these old iPhone designs here, you know, there's this aluminum band that goes around uh, the outside of the iPhone, at least in the older models, they, they had something like that. All right. And um, so what it was, it, it, it wasn't a loop that went all the way around. It was actually a piece of aluminum that went all the way around and, th and then it had, there's a slight space here. So uh, there was a slot in the middle. So uh, can you guys see this? Um, can you see this uh, slot where, where the mouse is here? Yeah. So it wasn't a continuous piece of metal. It was like a, a band that kind of fit all the way around. And the length of that band was tuned so that it picks up, uh, picks up the radiation in, in the frequencies in the cellular range. Right? Um, but here's the thing they didn't really plan for, is that um, if, if you were to, you know, if you, if you have this device and it's sitting on a table, it operates beautifully. But if you take, um, if you take a, a finger, which has water in it, and water is slightly conductive, it's kind of like a lossy, a lossy conductor. And you change the electromagnetic signals at the at the ends of the antenna, and then you totally kill the antenna. All right. So uh, people went like completely bonkers about it. You know, first world problem. We can't use our cell phones. And uh, they it, so Apple initially said, oh, you know, like <laughs> Apple put it in a place where it just happened to be like the place where most people hold their phones really tightly. So they called it the grip of death. You can read about, like, you know, I, I uploaded the notes. You can read the article about this. this is from, like, I think 2005 or so. Um, first, Apple denied that it was a problem. And then Steve Jobs famously said, oh, just hold it differently. You'll be fine. <laughs> and people went, <laughs> people totally had a fit about it. <laughs> and then finally, Apple, um, Apple's engineers came up with a way to get around it. And what they did is they gave these bumper cases. They, so they gave these bumper cases away from free. And what the bumper case, all it did was it, it, had, it was just like a piece of rubber that fitted around the band. And so now when you put your finger on it, your finger wasn't directly on the antenna. There was a little bit of space between your finger and the, and the antenna. And that was enough to uh, allow it to transmit. Okay. <laughs> you know, so that's one of the best industry examples of uh, how poor antenna design could completely kill, uh, kill a product. So are they still doing that? Still on the Apparently, an Apple iPhone Seven that the article was saying that Apple still hasn't learned its lesson because they were showing that. Uh, does, do we have the? Uh, I just got that. Um, yeah, the, the article was saying that, <laughs> that Apple set iPhone Seven still had the same type of uh, antenna design, but they've I think they've improved it in some way, so it's not as much of an issue. And nowadays, a lot of people use cases anyway, so that helps with the problem I think uh, we spent a lot of time like uh, figuring out the antenna design for this thing to make it make it compact all right well I'm going at a really slow rate but that's okay I think um, I think you'll find this interesting uh, another area of wireless is uh, electromagnetics and wireless is RFIDs um, some of you have used um, these types of RFID tags um, if you have uh, a car that has a security system on it, cars typically have RFID, your, your keys, if you have like a, a push button start type system, you know, those, and even the key ones, key based ones, 
uh, have these RFID tags embedded inside the key. So your car knows if it's your key being used or if someone if it's if it's a fake key. All right. So um, the way that RFID works is that you have a reader, um, and the reader go um, the signal. There's a voltage signal that goes into an antenna, and the antenna is, schematically is just shown as a coil. Um, antennas can be coil type antennas, but they can be different types of antennas as well. Um, and uh, this goes into a chip, um, a device that has an antenna a capacitor on it. And it turns out that this tag, interestingly, it doesn't require a battery. What it does is that it reflects, it reflects the electromagnetic signal back to the reader, which is why they're so cheap. You know, you don't need any passive battery, you don't need any active components, you don't, you, all you need is an antenna and a specific, um, you could just have a specific design of a spiral uh, trace that would that could serve as an RFID tag. The purpose of the RFID tag, there's, there's an antenna on it that receives electromagnetic radiation and it reflects back electromagnetic radiation. At certain frequencies that there's going to be a resonance between the two, so the, the signal that the RFID reader returns is, is lar gets back is larger. And so this is all based on just uh, electromagnetic um, uh, wave propagation. Um, and some obviously some circuit stuff as well. So we're not going to go into the details of it. I just want to make you aware of it. Now this is what the typical size of an RFID tag looks like. Um, they, you know, th they're embedded into um, into devices that are used to open doors for like secure work environments. They're embedded in in cars. If some of you have done like um, you know races, like uh, you know running races or uh, biking races or what what have you. Uh, they often give you an RFID tag that you can put on your ankle or something like that. And so when you run over these special mats, the mats pick up when, you know, your timing, when you cross the finish line, when you cross the mile marker and so forth. Um, they're also used for inventory. Uh, so large warehouses will have RFID tags. You know, like instead of using barcodes, you know, in, in Kroger when you go and you, <laughs> you know, you have that like uh, barcode reader. Um, RFID tags is an alternative to barcode readers. You don't actually have to have the device right next to it scanning it. You can just, um, you can have a, an external reader that just sends out an electromagnetic signal and looks at the reflected signals. So it's good for um, uh, identifying objects uh, completely wirelessly. wirelessly. Um, another good example of that is uh, things like the uh, um, RFID based um, uh, highway tolls. We don't have too many toll I don't think we have any toll highways in Michigan. We, maybe, maybe we should, consider it might help repair our roads. But um, in, in a lot of states, you'll see stuff like this, where you have an RFID tag that's on your car windshield. As you're driving through uh, this this little like monitor device, like it'll read that your car passed, and then they'll send you the bill for the, um, the toll that way. Um, so low frequency uh, RFID systems, they usually use coil type antennas and then high frequency systems use uh, dipole, uh, dipole type antennas. Ha do any of you use any uh, RFIDs, any of the companies that you all work at, does, do they use RFID for anything? Inventory management, things like that? Okay, just curious. Yeah, so this chart shows like, you know, the different types of RFID frequencies that are uh, currently used and the data rates that you can get out of them and the typical um, typical applications. Um, moving on, so electromagnetics can be used for remote sensing. Uh, there was a lot of cool stuff that uh, we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now we can use devices or antennas to um, detect uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum and that can tell us a lot about um, an environment that we can't physically go to. Uh, astronomers have been using this principle for, you know, for centuries to look at and examine and make uh, theories about what's going on in other planets. You know, like how um, uh, we have like uh, uh, spacecraft that are going to these different planets and, you know, just by the spacecraft going by there, they say, oh, you know, like, um, Saturn's moon, uh, in Cleitus, was it Jupiter or Saturn's moon has, has methane geysers coming out, you know, like that, that this planet is made of this type of atmosphere or this, um, this star that's 
many light years away is um, is uh, is uh, um, you know having this type of reaction as opposed to that one. It's all based on um, electromagnetic radiation. They do a technique called spectroscopy, and spectroscopy is just a fancy word for saying we are detecting many parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and then we're we're using um, using some type of model to determine to tell us what that means. So, for example, um, Jupiter. Um, you know, they can detect, there are detectors that can detect radio waves uh, coming out of, you know, coming out of the Jupiter from the two sides, as you can kind of see in this image. So astronomers, by detecting those fields, by detecting those waves, and they're, they're all done through just by looking at the electromagnetic uh, signals that are being given off by the planet, they can actually make conclusions about Jupiter's magnetic field and um, atmosphere and so on and so forth. I, I couldn't tell you the details of all that stuff, uh, but you can certainly look that up um, online. Um, these are examples of um, things that are happening on, on near the poles of the planets. This is an image of uh, the top part of Jupiter when, when there's ions from the sun that smash into it. They give off certain types of electromagnetic radiation when they do that. Um, this is from this year. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with this, but um, did anyone hear about the Event Horizon Telescope? 2019, the first image of a black hole. Yes. Yes. Did yeah. okay. Uh, let's you know, you just quickly look at that. Full screen is unavailable. Oh. So all they're doing here is they're they are zooming in. Um, actually, let me back up. It's, it's just 30 second video, so. Oops, let's get away from there. So they built a, a telescope that um, on Earth that had uh, multiple... It was actually made up of multiple telescopes at different parts of the planet. And it was able to see a, um, see a black hole by looking at the radiation around it, not in it. Very dramatic music. Yeah. So, um, give you a little bit of context. Is that, yeah, some of you know, like black holes, like they they suck up all the light around it, so they don't give off. Um, the the interior of the black hole doesn't give off light, but there's something around it. There's something called a, an event horizon, like beyond the event horizon, light can escape, and so they try to detect things like that. Um, for for a long time, uh, astronomers tried to detect black holes by looking at X-ray radiation being given off by the surrounding areas. So I, I'm not, you know, astrophysicist where I can tell you all the details of that, but but the point is that, you know, all this stuff is based on electromagnetic uh, sensing, remote sensing. Um, we have various types of satellites that are orbiting Earth right now that that look at um, wavelengths at different different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are being given off, and they can do imaging. They can measure things like. Uh, um, temperatures on Earth, things related to climate change, pollution. They can measure, um, I mean, they can do imaging for military type applications. Um, and uh, there's even this um, thing now where they can actually look at the quality of soil for, for farmers by like doing like remote sensing that way. It's pretty amazing. So like it would totally change the whole field of like agriculture. All right. So let's move on. All right, I mentioned that electromagnetics is used for medical imaging quite a bit. Uh, some of the uh, main modalities of imaging that you may be familiar with is um, PET. Well, PET is not used so much. Positron emission tomography uses, um, as I showed you on the previous slide, it uses like X-ray, high energy X-rays to perform high resolution imaging. Uh, CT is a form of X-ray, it's a form of three-dimensional X-ray. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging is um, probably the most um, most high resolution form of three dimensional medical imaging that we currently have. Has anyone had an MRI done before? You don't have to if you're if you're you know if if you if, if you're private about it, that's totally fine. But like yeah, I um, I've had one MRI been done before. If a lot of people I know have had. It's it's quite amazing, like the the three dimensional information that you get from it. 
So my um, my wife was taking a class in um, in the medical imaging, and uh, you know she showed me how some of these MRI devices work, and it's quite it's really really amazing. And I realized that it's all it's all based on electromagnetics. It's quite amazing. Like this, uh, you have the person that goes in uh, in into this device that looks like a big tube. The reason why it's a tube is because they have a coil going around it. They have this massive, massive coil that goes around the individual. Okay, and when you run current through that coil, it generates an electromagnetic uh, electromagnet. All right, so it generates this very strong magnetic field that goes right through the tube. All right, and that um, then they, they modulate that m magnetic field in very specific ways, and um, the, the magnetic field actually causes uh, water molecules to respond in a certain way. They modulate the magnetic field at a high frequency, and it causes um, water molecules to vibrate a certain way. And um, things that are not water or, or made of different materials, they vibrate in a slightly different way. So this allows you to generate images with different contrast, where like you know things that vibrate a lot will show up in a certain color or certain grayscale, and things that don't vibrate at, as much will show up at a different grayscale. And so that allows you to do imaging. And then you can actually scan through the entire person's body to generate a three-dimensional image. It's, it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. And it's all based on um, principles of electromagnets and based on principles of uh, polarization of molecules, which we'll talk about in chapter three, and um, also on um, you know, basic Maxwell's equations of, um, of magnetic fields. Quite interesting. And um, uh, nowadays, uh, people are using MRIs to actually look at brain activity. Uh, people can, uh, some really striking examples of that is when they took um, individuals who were, um, uh, who were considered to be vegetables, like they, they, they couldn't respond, talk or anything. They, they, people were considered to be vegetables. They put them under the MRI and they asked the person to think about something in, in to, to be able to respond to a question. Think about playing a tennis game, tennis match, or think about playing basketball, and two different areas of the brain activate. They can actually look at that under an MRI and see which parts of the brain are getting more blood flow and to actually be able to see what people are thinking. I thought that was a pretty striking example. And then um, I think recently I, I was forwarded an article about someone how someone put a, a pug, a dog, <laughs> into the MRI to see like how the pug was responding to certain things. Pretty funny. But anyway, um, electromagnetics um, plays an important role in, uh, in, in medical and also high energy physics using something called linear accelerators. So one of the things we're going to be talking about in this class is how an electromagnetic field exerts force on a particle. So I, I drew this picture of uh, a, a very basic field generator up here where you have you have two metal plates and you just put a voltage source across it. You put a battery on it. So one side of the plate is high voltage, the other side is low voltage. And between those plates you get an electric field. All right. If you if you if you use a nine volt battery, you're not going to get much of an electric field. But if you use um, if you use thousands of volts or perhaps millions of volts, you're going to get a significant electric field there, and you can do stuff with it. Yeah. Question. What, what the large hadron collider does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so. And I'm glad you asked. This is um, this is actually a picture of CERN, the the system out in out in Europe that does that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Um, so how, how certain, this is an example about how a linear particle accelerator works. This is used for radiation therapy and cancer treatment. So in, in, cancer, in cancer therapy, you have to take high energy particles and just shoot them into the region of the body where the tumor is. That when, when you hear of someone getting radiation therapy, that's essentially what they're doing. And so to generate those high energy particles, they use something called uh, a LINAC, uh, which is called a linear accelerator. And um, the way it works is that you have a series of tubes that are in getting increasingly wider. Okay, you have a small tube, a larger one, a larger one, a larger one. And what, you're, what you have here is you're alternating. Whenever you apply a positive voltage to this one, the next tube is negative. Then you apply a positive voltage to this one, and the next tube is negative. You're alternating the electric field here. 
So as I mentioned, so if you generate an electric field, and if I were to put a particle here, let's say I were to put a positive charge here. We're going to be talking about this later in the semester, so um, it'll become a lot more clear. Um, so if I put a voltage across a series of metal, two metal plates like this, this side acquires a positive charge, this side acquires a negative charge. If I have a positive charge up here, what's going to happen to it? It's going to push it down. Why? Because of something called Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law means like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Right? So this particle gets accelerated this way by the electric field. That's the very simple basis for linear accelerators. Now what linear accelerators do is that they, they take this to a whole new level. If you just have a basic accelerator like this, you know, just like two plates, you're going to accelerate the, uh, pro, uh, the particle going from here to here. But once it gets here, that's the maximum speed it can get, right? So it's going to move this way. It's going to gain speed. It's going to gain speed. And it's going to get the fastest speed when it gets out to here. Right? But that's the maximum velocity that you can go. If you need a high energy particle, you need even higher velocities than what a system like that can do. So you use something called the linear accelerator. And this is an animation of it. What, what it's doing, it's actually alternating. Um, it's using an AC field. And each segment of the tube is, at a, um, is at also at alternating uh, voltages. So if we were to pause it here, OK? So you can see that this is positive and then this is negative. So when uh, if there's an electron going between these two tubes, they'll get accelerated in this region here. OK? And the same electron will travel through the tube by inertia. And then when it gets to this part, it'll get accelerated again at this interface and again at this interface. So every time it goes through one of those segments of tubing, the, um, the electron is accelerated just a little bit more. Yes? Wait, why doesn't it get drawn back again? Um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't get drawn back because you're constantly alternating the field. Oh, that's right. That's, right. that's what. The, that's what the cool thing about the Linac is. You're you're alternating the field at a very precise timing so that an electron gains a certain speed and then it gets accelerated, gains a little bit more speed, and then it's accelerated more. That's the reason why the tubes are getting increasingly longer as you go down because electrons are going faster and faster. Right. So. Um, this is the basis for uh, a Linux, and those Linux are used to accelerate particles that are used in radiation therapy, uh, therapy for cancer treatment. It's also used in um, these uh, huge devices, um, like the Large Hadron Collider that's out in uh, Europe, that's used for high energy, phys high energy physics research. Um, if you if we look at a picture of the Large Hadron Collider, it's like they're like several miles long. They have um, they have tubes like this where they're uh, energizing the particles, and these tubes have massive like electric ma and magnetic fields around them that's used to accelerate the particles just through basic electromagnetic principles. But these things are super long, so the longer it is, the more you can accelerate the particle, the more energy you can give the particle. That's why they spend literally billions of dollars on um, these things that are miles long because they can accelerate these particles to really, really high speeds, allowing physicists to do um, high energy experiments. And um, this system led to the um, discovery of the Higgs boson a couple of years ago. I think that was a big splash in the news. Um, that was because of a lot of the uh, massive amounts of money that was spent in making these uh, accelerators that are literally miles long. All right. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So, um, yeah, we will cover as much as we can in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. All right, now we're going to um, switch gears and go back to the small scale. So, this is electromagnetics plays an important role in uh, various types of microsensors um, that. Uh, have become very popular because they we're able to make them very small. Um, let me share with you just a little interesting part of physics. Again, using this as an example.
Um, you know what? I think I have my. I actually want to try this out. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. I think I can draw in here. You all may be able to see easier. And it also gets recorded, so that's nice. Is this working? OK. So yeah, let's say I have my basic electric field generator again. Yeah, I put a, a positive voltage on here, so I get positive charges up here, negative charges down here, and I get an electric field pointed this way. Well, it turns out that the electric field this is equal to V divided by L. And L is just the distance between, um, between here. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, if I want to generate a large electric field, I have two choices. I can either increase the voltage to thousands or millions of volts, which is not easy to do. Or I can take L and make it really small, right? So these electrostatic sensors, what they do is they make uh, they make the L very small. So you can generate large electric field, large um, electric field by making L small. Where'd my pen go? There you go. Ah, no, it's not too thick. All right, that better. All right. So when you have large electric fields, what you can do is you can um, you can detect you can use electrostatic fields for detection. You can also use electrostatic fields for actuation. Does anyone know what actuation means? Actuation means moving things. Being able to move things. All right. Generally, we don't like um, if we look at like being able to like uh, uh, move stuff. Electro ele electrostatic fields are not good at generating large forces because electric fields that we generate are typically small. <laughs> but if we make if we make a very strong electric field by making this L small, then we can actually start to do stuff with electric uh, electro uh, electrostatic fields. And believe it or not, this concept. It's only been around for um, 25 years, the last 25 years. Why? Because we actually have found manufacturing technologies to make that L very, very small. Have any of you heard of micro and nanotechnologies, the term? It's basically a, a term that's used to describe manufacturing processes that allows us to make very, very small devices. Micro and nanotechnology, the whole field, uses techniques that are borrowed from the semiconductor industry. Like the techniques that Intel has been using for since the 1950s to make their transistors smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, the micro and nano uh, technology field uses the similar fabrication technologies to make other types of objects. And this particular device, which is a microsensor, um, utilizes that very principle to make this um, electric field generator very small. So um, what I showed you here it's not just an electric field generator, it's also better known as a capacitor. Anytime you have two parallel plates, it's a capacitor, right? So um, there's two things that happens. When you make these devices very small and you generate large electric fields, now you get a force. You actually get an attractive force between the two plates. You can, you know, because you're putting positive charge on one plate and negative charge on the other plate, right? So the two plates are attracted to each other. And that allows you to make an actuator. So you can actually make these devices that have moving parts in them. 
and um, uh, and you can also detect movement from them. So as a capacitor, I, I'm just you know c equals epsilon a over uh, l. That's the formula for a basic parallel plate capacitor. If if these plates actually move on their own, then the capacitance changes, and you can detect the change in capacitance. So that basic idea is the, the it's the whole idea behind uh, capacitive accelerometers that we use in basically everything nowadays. So your iPhones, you know, when you rotate the screen, you rotate the phone, the screen ro rotates. That uses an accelerometer. If you unfortunately, if you've ever been the have the misfortune of being in an accident uh, and your airbags deployed, those airbag deployment sensors are capacitive accelerometers. Um, you know, when it when the sudden change in acceleration happens, the distance between the two plates changes. There's a change in capacitance. That change in capacitance is detected within within a few milliseconds, and then your car's airbag deploys. Before the 1990s, airbags were very expensive to put in cars. Typical cars only had one airbag, maybe two. Nowadays, cars have like eight airbags, like side, top, roof, everything, you know? Like, you're literally like enclosed in an airbag if you ever get in an accident, which is great. Um, one of the reasons why airbags have become cheaper is because these accelerometer devices are dirt cheap to make. You can buy them for a dollar, less than a dollar. Um, that device that I passed around, by the way, you probably didn't notice it because it was so small, but it actually has an accelerometer on it. They're literally this big, two by two millimeters. Amazing. Um, so they're also used in um, in the Nintendo Wii. You know, if anyone played the Nintendo Wii, like any type of motion sensors. Um, nowadays, they're used in all sorts of applications, wearable devices for tracking, you know, how many steps you've taken, um, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. I recently, like, um, I don't know if any of you have this or not, but like, um, I got a not notification from an insurance company the other day. It's like, hey, we'll give you several hundred dollars off on your ins on your insurance if you um, take this device that we send to you and and you put it in your car. It's like, what is that? Did, has anyone heard? Yeah. 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 Okay. Guess what those are? They're accelerometers. You know what they're detecting? <laughs> <laughs> they're detecting how quickly you're accelerating and braking, you know, and how quickly you're taking turns. You know, your insurance company can basically, you know, get an idea of like if you're a safe driver or a rough driver. Well, you should take that, right? <laughs> What's that? You should take that device so you can get the hundred dollars off or whatever, and just enable your location on that app so that they can track you. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good idea. I'll try that. <laughs> That's what I do with progress. That's insurance fraud, bro. <laughs> well, we won't get into that here. Are you going to your grandma? All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, sorry, everyone. We, we still have like a few minutes left here. So, uh, but wait, did I have the time right? Is it 10 after? Yeah, yeah. We still have six minutes left here. Okay, I want to get through some more of this material. So um, capacitive sensors is one thing, right? So we, in, in the case of sensors, we had a capacitor and we were detecting the change in distance between the plates when there was motion. All right, causes a change in capacitance and that change in capacitance is used to measure motion. We can go in the opposite direction too. When we have a parallel plate system like this, as I mentioned to you earlier, there's an attractive force there's an attractive force between the two plates. We are going to talk about electrostatic forces in chapter three. Actually, in the next module, as soon as we cover vector map. Um, so, one of the cool things that came out of that was uh, a technology called digital micromirror devices. Again, this is a microfabricated device. The L, the distance between the pl plates of the capacitor, was made very, very small so that you could generate substantial electrostatic forces. Um, has anyone heard of a DMD or a DLP? Has anyone heard of a DLP, digital light projector? Okay. Um, well, anytime you go to uh, AMC or Star Movie Theater and you're watching the latest, um, you know, the latest and greatest movie, uh, most of the uh, 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 high high grade movie projectors use uh, DLPs in them, and you can even buy them too for your home if you have a home thing. They cost like a thousand bucks or so. 
uh, but how they work is quite amazing. I want to um, open this up and you can see. D consists of an array of hundreds of thousands to even millions of tiny microbeers. Each of these microbeers is on the order of about 10 microns in size. That's one tenth the size of human hair. The DMP is created using TI's proven semiconductor manufacturing processes. TI has delivered over 40 million DMDs since 1996. Each micromere consists of a CMOS memory cell upon which the reflective aluminum micromere structure is built. The micromere, or pixel, is highly efficient at reflecting UV, visible, and infrared light. How it moves is the interesting part. state device that can be operated at either plus 12 degrees or minus 12 degrees. During operation, a one or a zero will be looked. All right, I'm just going to um, show you a basic thing about how it works. Um, this is a very simplified schematic, okay? Um, all right, imagine you have a little seesaw like this, okay? This thing is um, the micromirror device is built on a seesaw. All right, so you put, let's say you put a voltage. Let's say you put a voltage between here and here. You're going to end up with positive charge buildup on this plate, just like a capacitor. And you're going to end up with negative charge buildup on this plate. All right. So positive and negative charges attract, right? So this teeter totter is going to bend over at an angle. All right. And then you could do the same thing if you apply a voltage on the other side, then it's going to teeter totter at the other angle. What's the purpose? So get back to this video. Loaded into the memory cell for each micromere, which allows independent control of each pixel. A micromere clocking pulse is then applied, and the mirror will update to either a plus 12 degree state for a 1 or a minus 12 degree state for a 0. Two possible positions of the micromere. In a typical setup, the light sources, which could be an LED, a laser, or a lamp, will illuminate the DMD at an angle of 24 degrees. Each pixel then directs light to one of the two output ports. The DMD is capable of displaying patterns at speeds up to tens of kilohertz, making it one of the fastest spatial light modulators available. TI has a broad portfolio of DLP micromere arrays to meet your needs, ranging from a wide right, The rest of this is an advertisement. <laughs> um, so what it's doing is like, if, if the mirror is in a certain position, the light gets reflected and it goes out into the movie screen. Okay? And if it's in the other position, the light is not going out to the movie screen. So basically by the position of each of the mirror, it's controlling whether the, whether the position on the screen, whether the pixel on the screen is light or dark. So there's many, several million <coughs> micromirrors in just this little chip, the, the DLP chip. It's become one of the most successful things that TI has ever made, 2.5 billion in sales. Um, and nowadays they're, they're in, they have in full HD, they have 4K DLP chips as well. Um, DLP works much better than, um, well, first of all, in a movie theater, you can't have a massive, uh, a massive TV screen, right? You have to have a projector. Well, it turns out that DLP technology makes great projectors and each one of the pixels basically rotates. There's millions of these micromirrors that ro rotating at speeds of 60 hertz at speeds that your eye can't even see. So by rotating those mirrors into the on and off positions and by flashing like red, green, and blue light onto the micro mirror and, and, and reflecting it on the screen, it's actually able to generate an, an, uh, a moving image on the screen. All right, and that's all based on just this simple concept of um, an elect um, you know, two metal plates, you apply voltage between them, electrostatic force, it reflects. It's a very, very simple principle, but what TI did is they, they built a manufacturing technology. It's like an incredibly complex device to make. All the engineering that goes into it, a brilliant, um, they connect it with a brilliant application and it's, it's been a massively successful device. All right, so good. I think that that's a good place to end today. We'll talk a little bit more. We'll finish up this module next class period and then we'll get into vector math. <laughs> Is that was a hair.
Monday.